Welcome back, Bree. I know you have a radar prepared for us. <laughs> that, Tell us. that I do, Amber, <laughs> that I do. Look, tonight's State of the Union may be a harbinger of Joe Biden's ultimate political fate. Polls for the president predict real problems. Trump leads Biden in national polls 48 to 43 percent. And at 47 percent, Biden's disapproval ratings are at an all time high. As establishment Democrats point out, the age difference between Biden and Trump isn't so large. Biden is seen as uniquely mentally incapable by a whopping six in 10 voters. Now, it could be that more exposure to the press could assuage voters' misconceptions about a candidate's fitness. But Biden has largely declined to meet the press, setting a record for fewest news conferences since Reagan, who famously suffered from Alzheimer's at the end of his presidency. And recent press appearances suggest that Frankly, the less we see of him, the better. Last month, Biden canceled the traditional pre-Super Bowl presidential interview for the second year in a row. And days later, at an impromptu press conference called to refute accusations from the Her Classified Document report that he was cognitively impaired, he fumbled the ball, mixing up the president of Mexico and the president of Egypt. Now all eyes are on Biden's State of the Union performance. Can he present as cogent, able, and energetic, but also can he ally the substantive concerns of an electorate whose disappointment in Biden extends well beyond his chronological age? Is age Biden's biggest weakness, or is it in fact his inability or unwillingness to stand up to Benjamin Netanyahu on behalf of the American people? Biden supporters, both within the party and in the liberal media sphere, have long argued that by election day, voters will be so focused on saving democracy, on defeating Donald Trump and guarding against a repeat of January 6th, that their concerns about cost of living, age, and foreign wars will be moot. But I suspect that October 7th, not January 6th, will be the date that's more front of mind for the American public on Election Day. And here's why it will certainly be on my mind. Five months to the day after October 7th, today, over 30,000 Gazans have been killed by Israeli bombs, bullets, or as a consequence of the famine that now threatens their surviving population. Experts project between 58 and 67,000 excess deaths, that is, deaths from disease, lack of medical care, sanitation, or violence from the IDF, over the next six months. In other words, the scale of the tragedy is expected to be larger, not smaller, closer to Election Day. And to be clear, that's the projection estimated by researchers at the Johns Hopkins University Center for Humanitarian Health and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, even if there is a ceasefire. Concerns seem to have finally broken through to the White House, perhaps as a result of a pro-ceasefire protest movement that's so consistent that it's forced Biden to, repeated, to reportedly avoid college campuses altogether. And all that ruined APAC backed Adam Schiff's victory speech earlier this week. Or perhaps it's the result of the overwhelming success of the pro-Palestinian uncommitted campaign, which, with a budget less than that of a salary of a low-level Biden staffer, managed to garner hundreds of thousands of protest votes from core Biden voters across the country, including garnering over 100,000 votes in Michigan, where Biden won in 2020 with only about 150,000 votes. But instead of responding with a policy shift, Biden has chosen a rhetorical one, redefining what ceasefire means. Remember that for months, the word ceasefire was poisoned to Democrats. White House Press Secretary Queen Jean-Pierre called progressive Congress members who called for a ceasefire back in October, quote, disgraceful and repugnant. But just before Michigan voted last week, Biden soft launched a rebrand as a pro-ceasefire candidate opining on a potential genocide while munching ice cream, optics that might have made Marie Antoinette herself a little cringe. Kamala Harris became the face of this PR pivot this week with a much-hyped ceasefire speech. But, of course, this is not a substantive pivot. You see, the goal of the ceasefire movement is not to allow a mere humanitarian pause to stem the bleeding, both proverbial and literal. The goal of the ceasefire movement is to permanently end the siege of Gaza and to deter Israel's stated plans for occupation and perhaps even ethnic cleansing.
To be clear, when I describe Israel's agenda as stated, it's because I'm citing statements from the most senior corners of Netanyahu's government. This is not mere editorializing. For example, a leaked diplomatic cable published by The Intercept from the U.S. Embassy in Israel sent just on Monday warned that a ground invasion could, quote, result in catastrophic humanitarian consequences, including mass civilian casualties, extensive population displacement, and the collapse of the existing humanitarian response. Netanyahu has said he will be invading Rafah, the southern Gaza city, where 1.5 million Palestinians are now living shoulder to shoulder, regardless of whether or not a temporary pause, now being described as a ceasefire, is negotiated. It has to be done, Bibi said, because, quote, our total victory is the goal, and total victory is within reach. Undermining claims that this is not a war of colonial expansion, Israel is constructing a permanent buffer zone along its border with Gaza, in effect claiming additional territory within the walled region for Israel. In the words of then-Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen, quote, at the end of this war, not only will Hamas no longer be in Gaza, but the territory of Gaza will also decrease. Mind you, this is not empty land, this border zone. The Washington Post reported 2,850 buildings were once in the planned buffer zone, though Israel had destroyed over 1,000 of those buildings as of the time that article was written in January. Netanyahu coalition partner Amahai Elihu said, has said that dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza is also an option. And Israel's then information minister argued that Israel should erase all of Gaza from the face of the earth and drive Gazans into exile in Egypt. Israeli finance minister Smotrich said Israel, quote, would no longer be able to accept an independent Palestinian entity in Gaza. And as reported in a radar last month, 14 members of Bibi's cabinet, including Smotrich, attended a settlement conference celebrating the opportunities to claim Gazan land for Israeli settlers. A temporary ceasefire addresses none of Hamas's concerns about the risk that Gaza might be ethnically cleansed. After all, there was once a ceasefire at the end of last year, and Gazan deaths have approximately doubled since that temporary ceasefire. While Biden claims to support a humanitarian ceasefire, new reporting reveals that America has been providing previously unknown volumes of lethal aid to Israel. Just yesterday, the Washington Post reported that the U.S. has quietly approved more than 100 separate military sales to Israel since October 7th, including thousands of precision-guided munitions, small-diameter bombs, bunker busters, small arms, and other lethal aid. Food aid to Gaza has to be airdropped because our ally, Israel, is substantially blocking humanitarian aid. But American weapons have no problem making their way to Israel. Last week brought this tension to a head in a so-called flower massacre that ensued after IDF soldiers shot dozens of starving Palestinians as they approached a rare food truck. Israel denied allegations that its soldiers had intentionally shot dozens of Palestinians seeking food for themselves and their families, putting out a video that claimed to show the deaths were a result of a stampede. But a BBC investigation showed that the footage had been edited four times, potentially excluding footage that might have showed IDF soldiers opening fire on Palestinians. And now, Euromed Monitor and other outlets have confirmed that most of those treated following the massacre suffered from bullet wounds, not the effects of trampling. Specifically, 5.56 times 5 millimeter NATO bullets common to Israeli army weapons. Again and again, the brutality of Israel's siege is apparent, but it seems that no action taken by the Israeli government will jostle Americans, America's commitment to fight funding such atrocities. Just yesterday, protesters from the anti-war group Code Pink approached Tennessee Representative Chuck Fleischman in the halls of Congress about whether he's concerned about Palestinian casualties. And this was the result. You can tell the Palestinians, I will never I support them. Why do you support the genocide and all the war crimes and collective punishment? 
Are you concerned let about me all make the children? It, let me make it clear. Gaza? Let me make it clear. Israel is our ally, will always be our ally. Even if they commit war crimes? they are not guilty of genocide, so and why? I will support Israel forever. You will so Israel will stay your ally, even though they commit Israel genocide. Will be my, uh, even, even though, even that's that. your term. Even Can when you they explain? Kill, that is your term. Even when they kill 30,000 kids. That is a statistic. That's 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 a statistic. Goodbye, we'll support to Palestine. Israel. Goodbye, Palestine. Goodbye, Palestine. We will support Israel forever. And while Fleischmann's remarks are somewhat unique in tone and substance, they accurately represent the position of the Democratic Party. You see, the Biden administration represented that it was opposed to a famine, a ground invasion of Rafah without humanitarian safeguards, in effect, uh, Israeli buffer zones or settlement expansion, but it steadfastly refuses to use its leverage to influence Israel's behavior. At press conferences, Biden representatives claim ignorance, punt investigations into claimed abuses to Israel to self-regulate, or say that America has no say in how Israel, an autonomous country, conducts its operations. Quite a departure from how America usually uses sanctions and other monetary and military threats to secure its influence around the world. Listen to this excellent questioning from The Hill's own Niall Stanich. You've laid out now a couple of times the practical challenges that will be part of this airdrop or these airdrops. And I'm kind of curious about that because those are risks that the United States now has to take on for itself, conducting those airdrops. The reason those risks now fall to the United States is because Israel is starving those people. So why are we still so supportive of Israel when it is the one that is creating the problem that the United States now has to try to ameliorate? Israel itself has tried to, uh, to help with uh, the delivery of humanitarian assistance. As I said, they tried airdrops themselves uh, just a week or so ago uh, on their own accord. So why uh, we, are many people still starving? We, it's a it's a war zone, and they and there's there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, it's not like in some other con conflicts where they can they can easily flee. And and let's not forget how this started. Okay, uh, th there'd be no need for airdrops um, if Hamas hadn't chosen to break what was a ceasefire in place on the sixth of October. The pundit class is consumed with how to remedy Biden looking weak due to his age or perceived cognitive fitness, but in some ways, his complete inability or unwillingness to stand up to Benjamin Netanyahu might be more debasing and debilitating than his verbal gaffes or stilted gait. And no rebranding of the word ceasefire or well-delivered State of the Union is likely to restore his stature in the eyes of millions of Americans who don't want the blood of over 10,000 children on their hands. Yeah, so this is, this is where I've ended up. I've been thinking more and more about this pundit push to really focus in on the idea of Biden's mental acuity being resolved by this State of the Union speech and how 1-6, one 1-6, six, one six, I keep saying 1-6 is gonna be the question on the ballot come fall. But realistically speaking, the death toll is expected to go up astronomically, even in the best case scenario of a ceasefire before then. At the same time, in press conference after press conference, and we're going to do another segment on a more recent press conference uh, later in the day, but you get uh, um, uh, journalists asking increasingly incisive questions, like Niall did just there. Why are we airdropping, and why are we resorting to airdropping to a uh, population controlled by one of our allies when it's our ally that's preventing food trucks from getting into Israel. Protesters are blocking food trucks, et cetera. Doesn't that, isn't there some tension there? We're saying that there are allies, but we obviously have diverging interests in this population. And we are doing an in run around a country over, we, over which we have so much authority, largely because we provide them with so many of their weapons and with more aid than any other country in the world. Isn't there a tension there? And you hear the kind of answers that we get. But that, to me, makes Biden look as weak as 
fumbling over his words in a press conference does. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think I'm pretty in the middle on this issue in terms of uh, I, I don't have like a historic passion for, for talking about it, but I would say that I probably stand with most Americans, which is we were horrified by what happened on October 7th, but the longer the conflict drags out, you start to gain a lot of sympathy for what's happening to the Palestinians, and there's really no justification for the way that Israel is waging its war. Um, and also find myself completely troubled by all of the misinformation Information that's been coming out about the conflict, frankly, from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw recently, for example, there was a, a, a photo of like a child from the Syrian conflict that was used as a, a mm -hmm. image of a Palestinian child. And then there's a lot of questions about the New York Times mass rape story mm -hmm. and rape being used as a weapon of war on the on the Israeli side. And uh, I just think that uh, Biden finds himself not even just in trouble uh, on this from the uncommitted voters, from the progressive left, but just the general American public seeing this as a larger symptom of his sort of feckless foreign policy. Yeah, I chose not to include, for lengthy reasons, um, a, a trend graph that shows how the, the, the Biden's approval on this issue uh, is going down and down and down as time goes on. And uh, yeah, here it is. This should be worrying to him. And Democrats who think that that line is going to switch course and not be more trouble for Biden the closer we get to January 6th. I mean, he has to do something to make that line curve. And I'm not clear that this rebranding effort that we've seen over the last week or so is going to get the job done. But we'll see what happens tonight at the State of the Union. Stick around. We've got more Rising for you coming up next. <laughs>